Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome up Barb Tr Triggs Rain, Professor and Head of Biochemistry and Medical Genetics. Barb. Thanks very much, Jeff. It's my pleasure. Because you gave me just the easiest job today, I thought. And that's because I don't think that Dr. Bersant needs a lot of introduction in Manitoba. She's come many times to visit us. But I know there's many people from outside of Manitoba. But I just wanted to mention that because, she, in general, Dr. Bersant has been so generous with her time, I think, for the scientific community in general that I wanted to mention that. And I recall a presentation that she gave in Winnipeg, and I think it was when she was winner of the Canada Gardner Whiteman Award in 2015. And it was a really interesting and exciting talk. But for those of you who may not know her, uh, she's a senior scientist emeritus at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, a professor emeritus at the University of Toronto, and as we heard earlier today, President and Scientific Director of the Gairdner Foundation. And she led the Research Institute at the Hospital for Sick Children between 2005 and 2015. Uh, now, Dr. Bersant is internationally known for her research in early embryo development and in stem cells that are derived from those embryos, and as well as in their applications for understanding and treating human disease and evolving from that, she's been very active in the ethics and public policy around stem cell research and modifications of those stem cells. And I recall some active discussion around that topic when she visited here. Possibly it was her last visit here. And I noticed that she continues to publish leading peer-reviewed papers and expert reviews in both of these areas, uh, even to the currently in 21 and 22. So it, she has an impressive career. And we can't really begin to list all of her awards, but there's a few that I'll just mention. She actually holds seven honorary degrees. She's been elected to the Royal Societies of London and Canada, as well as to the US National Academy of Sciences. In 2018, she received the North American L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Award, and in 2021, the International Society for Stem Cell Research Achievement Award. She's really had a distinguished career and continues to do so, and I'm excited to have her speak to us today. Her talk is entitled Human Embryos and Stem Cell Derived Embryo Models, The 14-Day Rule and Beyond. Please welcome Dr. Versant. Thank you. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here again. Um, and We'll be touching on some of the same areas that I presumably talked about in 2015 and in other visits as well, because I can't get away from being interested in the early embryo. You heard Sheena's interested in the brain, Matcha's interested in chromatin. We all have something that we're passionate about. And I've had a long career studying developmental biology, but the stage of development that I really like best is the one that's shown here, if I can work out how to advance the slides. There we go, the blastocyst. So this is the stage of development in a mammalian embryo when the embryo is just about to implant in the uterus. It has only three cell types, an outer layer of trophectoderm on the outside, a cavity in the middle, and a group of cells on one side here called the inner cell mass. And at this stage, this is a mouse blastocyst. It's got two cell types, the epiblast, which are pink because they're stained with an antibody to OCT4, which is a very famous pluripotency factor. And then on the surface are these primitive endoderm cells. Now, this is the size of a speck of dust. In the mouse, it takes four days to get to this point. A human embryo has the same three cell types, it takes six days to get to the same point. And if any of you have ever seen pictures of human blastocysts, they are nowhere near as beautiful as this mouse blastocyst. <laughs> it's actually amazing when you see some of the embryos that go through IVF cl clinics that they actually turn into babies. 
Um, but they do, most of them, but not all of them. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we and others are very interested in understanding these early stages of development from the egg to the blastocyst, because it is a very critical stage for normal development. And in humans, there's a huge amount of early pregnancy loss around this time of blastocyst implantation. So this is my favorite stage of development. I started working on this when I was a graduate student, and I'll show you some early, early, early uh, papers. Uh, and I've continued to come back to it ever since. Along the way, I've done many other things. And we've worked on different stages of development, and we've worked on technology. I've worked with Jeff Hicks on large-scale mutagenesis problems. Uh, you heard Sheena showing us how, how we could use uh, transgenic mice, we made the first black Z mice, we made the first diptheriotoxin uh, mice. We've always been involved in genetic manipulation, um, but as a tool and as a means to an end to study development. So here we are, the blastocyst, my favorite cell type. And if I could work out how to move this, there we go. And now you can watch it in real time. And this is some of the things we've done in the last few years. Now using CRISPR, we can tag all our favorite genes that we know over the years are important for blastocyst development. And we can tag them with different fluorescent markers. And then with live imaging, you can actually watch a blastocyst, the mouse blastocyst, develop. And you can see the gradual segregation of these two cell types. So here we're seeing CDX2, which is a gene transcription factor required for making trophoblast. And you're seeing SOX2, which is a pluripotency gene required to make the inner cell mass. And as the blastocyst develops, you see the two separating. And actually, this tells you something. You're seeing CDX2 everywhere becoming restricted to the outside, and only then do you see the pluripotency genes coming on? So being able to visualize this tells us something about the trajectories and the order and the way in which these genes are going to be regulated to set up the first lineages of the embryo. And one of the questions I started asking when I was a graduate student is, well, how we've got these two cell types. We make a blastocyst, the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm. The trophectoderm gives rise to the cells of the placenta. It's extra embryonic only. But the inner cell mass contains these pluripotent cells, the epiblast cells, that give rise to the entire fetus. So this first lineage decision is really critical for everything that follows. Now, how does it happen? And without going through years and years of experiments, I'm going to show you the biggest aha moment I think I had in all the years of studying blastocyst formation. We'd found the genes that were involved in specifying the cell types, the pluripotent cells, the trophectoderm cells, the transcription factors, but we had no idea how this dynamic process of segregation of the lineages was really controlled. And this was an aha moment. It was an aha moment uh, carried out actually by Amy Ralston, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time, has her own lab now at uh, Michigan State. And what Amy showed was that uh, a particular factor, YAP, and YAP some of you have probably heard of it. It pops up all over the place these days. It's a, a co-activator of transcription factors of the Teed family. And YAP is a co-activator that those transcription factor uh, genes require to activate downstream genes. And YAP can be phosphorylated. And when it's phosphorylated by components of the HIPPO signaling pathway, phosphorylation means that it can't enter the nucleus and therefore it can't bind to TED and transcription downstream doesn't happen. So the nuclear localization of YAP can be very important. We knew from studies in others that TED transcription factors were actually upstream of our favorite gene, CDS2. CDS2 required TED activity to be active. And what happens when you look at where YAP is, so how important it is to look at embryos. And what you see is that YAP by antibody staining is everywhere in the early embryo. And then as you start to get the outside cells, which we saw turning on CDX2, those outside cells have YAP in the nucleus. The inside cells have it excluded from the nucleus. And this continues through the morula stage to the blastocyst stage. And you see it nuclear in the trophectoderm and excluded in the inner cell mass. Overlay that with CDX2, and they're almost completely overlaying each other. So this said, aha, right now we can begin to understand that what must be happening here 
is that there is a signaling pathway that is phosphorylating YAP, that is modifying YAP, and that is really the kickoff for separ separating the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm. And again, I'm not going to go through all the science, but this is roughly what we think is happening now. This is the current model for how the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm are separated. There's still details we don't understand, but this is the major components. The outside cells are where uh, are going to form the trophectoderm. They, they have this localized CDH2. And in those outside cells, YAP is not phosphorylated, enters, binds T4, activates CDH2. It's not phosphorylated because to be phosphorylated, it actually has to be uh, phosphorylated by this complex, which contains components of cell adhesion, NF2, and this component, which is LATS, it's a serine threonine kinase, this complex can phosphorylate YAP, and it can only act in the inside cells. In the outside cells, the complex is torn apart because apical actin domains in these polarized outside cells lo localizes the LATS to, to the surface of the cell. The complex isn't there, YAP enters the nucleus. Inside cells, complex active, YAP enters the nucleus. So we think that cell adhesion, and we've shown cell adhesion is necessary, cell position is important, cell polarity, and importantly, because this has been shown in other systems, mechanical tension differs between these inside and outside cells. So the YAP is really a driver of this initial lineage segregation. And there are, as I say, many more com uh, sort of cellular and me mechanical details to be worked out here, but the overall system is quite clear. So. That's what's happening, making the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm. So there's another lineage decision that occurs before the embryo implants in the uterus, and that's making epiblast and primitive endoderm. You saw on the surface of the inner cell mass, the primitive endoderm, and the enclosed cells, are really the pluripotent cells that we really care about because they make the mouse, those get segregated from primitive endoderm. And if you just look at the embryo, you might think that is also position dependent because if you remember, the primitive endoderm was on the surface of the inner cell mass against the blastocele. And in fact, in one of my first papers as a graduate student in 1975, here I am in Oxford, uh, and if you read the last sentence of the abstract, what I did here was isolate the inner cell masses and show that they could actually regenerate a layer of primitive endoderm over the surface. It was always on the outside. And that led me to suggest um, that cell position might be important in endoderm differentiation, that even in these isolated inner cell masses, you've got endoderm all the way around the outside. So a bit like the inner cell mass versus trophectoderm. It's always good to have a hypothesis, and it's always good to test your hypothesis, and it's even better when you yourself, your own lab, can prove the hypothesis wrong. <laughs> and that's what... Uh, Postdocs in my lab at the time, uh, Yojiro Yamanaka and Frederick Lanner uh, and Claire Shozo did, because what we now know is that that's not what happens in the inner cell mass. Actually, the inner cell mass starts out as a mosaic of cells, and the different cells actually sort themselves out. So the epiblast is enclosed and the primitive endoderm on the surface. And of course, we know that now because you can look again always look at the embryo to see where the key genes that we know are important for epiblast and primitive endoderm, where they're expressed. And what we know, I showed you this already, here is the surface, this is GATA6, this is uh, NANOG, which is another pluripotency gene, and they're nicely separated. But a, a day earlier, in the earlier blastocyst, you get this mosaic. Some cells are positive for GATA6, some for, for NANOG, and there are some that are still double positive. And that initial picture then suggested what we call the pepper and salt uh, situation that you get in segregation. And we now know that's true. And we also know what drives it. And what drives it is levels of FGF signaling. So in the inner cell mass, individual cells read out the local level of FGF ERK signaling. And if you have high FGF signaling, then you become primitive endoderm. And if you have low FGF signal, if you're, the, if you're the secretor and not the responder, then you behave like an epiblast cell. And then as these two cells start to go down the pathway, they start to show differences in their cell surface properties, such that then they segregate out 
to form the epiblast and the primitive endoderm. So that's, this is, I would say, a much less well understood process. But what we know generally then, if we think about lineage establishment, is that the first lineage decision, the inner cell mastroaffectoderm, requires position dependent activation of hippo signaling for establishing cell fate. And then interestingly, the next lineage decision does something different. It requires some, what we call, you see the question mark there, stochastic, what usually means we just don't understand. What we know is that within the inner cell mass, cells are reading out local FGF signaling levels. That's causing negative feedback loops and then causing cell surface changes that cause cell sorting. This is still not understood. And there's just <laughs> increasing numbers of computational and mathematical modeling of what's going on within the inner cell mass that I read and I don't understand. But somebody's going to work this out. And it's not going to be me. But it is clearly true that the most important thing is the level of FGF ERK signaling. That determines which way you're going to go. And it's instructive. If you have too much FGF signaling, you become primitive endoderm. Too little, you stay as epiblast. So it's a very different process. Now, interestingly, FGF signaling has multiple uses in the embryo around implantation. And this takes me to another paper. So after I did my graduate work in uh, Oxford in Cambridge. I did my postdoc in Oxford. I married a Canadian and I moved to Canada and my first faculty of position was at Brock University. And this was one of my first papers from Brock University. And what we showed here was that the, the trophoblast cells at the blastocyst stage and in the early post-implantation stages, if you took them away from the embryo, they stopped dividing and transformed into trophoblast giant cells. And that suggested then, well, I said at the bottom here, I'm getting a bit more presumptuous now, not we suggest. We have a new model for the post-implantation trophoblast lineage uh, in the mouse. And the model is basically this, that the inner cell mass and the early post-implantation epiblast in contact with the trophoblast keeps those cells proliferating because they produce a signal, and we went on to show that that signal again is FGF. So FGF from the inner cell mass and the epiblast signals to the overlying trophoblast not to turn, change its fate, but to cause it to proliferate as a stem cell. So FGF signaling is required for trophoblast stem cell development in the embryo, and as you'll see in a minute, in the, in the uh, culture dish as well. So FGF is very important for the mouse blastocyst it's required, the levels of FGF really determine what kinds of stem cells you can grow in culture, reflecting how the FGF is used in the embryo itself. So I told you FGF is important for segregating the epiblast and primitive endoderm. I told you that FGF is important for proliferating the trophoblast. So what happens when you get stem cells? Well, of course, embryonic stem cells have been derived many years ago now, 1981, the first mouse ES cells. And they were grown in the presence of lif and serum. And when you do that, you actually get a kind of bit of a mosaic going on. And in some ways, it's quite similar to what we would see uh, in, the, in the inner cell mass. Because with the, uh, the uh, epiblast cells, the ES cells secrete FGF, and they talk to the cells next to them, and you start to get primitive endoderms. So it's, not a, it's a somewhat heterogeneous mixture. A few years ago now, Austin Smith's lab showed that if you block FGF signaling in ES cells, then essentially you make naive ES cells, and they all become like epiblasts. And I told you that's what happens in the embryo as well. So block FGF, you become epiblast. We generated trophoblast stem cells, and like the embryo, you require FGF signaling and active in nodal to maintain trophoblast stem cells. We also derive Zen cells and showed that to derive these, you also require FGF, just as we would show to get primitive endoderm from the embryo itself. So FGF levels determine the stem cells you can get from a mouse embryo. And here they are. Embryonic stem cells, of course, the most famous. They express the pluripotency transcription factors. They arise from the epiblast in the inner cell mass. And they are pluripotent. That is to say, they make the entire fetus, but they don't make the yolk sac and they don't make the placenta. That's because they remember what they were in the blastocysts themselves, and they are pluripotent, not totipotent. Trophoblast stem cells, 
come from the trophectoderm, their own transcription factors, put them back into a blastocyst, they make placenta, but not the fetus, and then Zen cells, their own transcription factors, just like the embryo. Uh, they look different, but they can grow indefinitely in culture. Put them in, the, in a chimera, they make yolk sac endoderm. So in the mouse, we have these very nice three lineage-specific stem cell lines. We've had them for a long time now. Of course, ES cells uh, in the mouse can be used for genetic modification. In the human, of course, they are the source of cells for stem cell-based therapy. But the other stem cells are also important because they give us ways of doing much more hardcore biochemistry to look at the pathways that maintain lineage specification. And also, they allow you to potentially model the early embryo. So as soon as we made ES cells, TS cells, and Zen cells, whenever I talked about them, people would ask, always ask me, well, what happens if you put them together? You've got the three stem cells from the blastocysts. What happens if you mix them up? I would go, well, you know, we've done a little bit of that, and they sort of sort themselves out, but you know, I don't think they really are mimicking normal development, and I'm not sure I want to go down that pathway, and you'll see why I said that in a minute. But others have done so, and this is a paper from Magda uh, Zernertje Goetz's lab in 2018, where they took ES cells and our TS and Zen cells, mixed them all up, and showed that in the best situations, you know, you always choose, this is a very carefully selected image from that paper, but in the best situation, you actually get these cells sorting themselves out to look quite similar to not a blastocyst, but an early post-implantation embryo. One of these is a normal embryo. One of these is what they call ETX. Do you know which is which? I think this is the embryo because it's a bit broken up here where it was attached to the uterus, and this is the the, the stem cell drive, but it, it, they do mimic quite nicely. And you can use these to look at some of the early interactions between the lineages that are important to begin the patterning in post-implantation development. More to my interest, of course, is can you actually make a blastocyst? And so this was work that's been done and been carried on uh, successfully by Nicolas Rivron, who was in, uh, in the Netherlands at the time, now is his lab in Vienna. And what Nicola did was to be a bit more, instead of just mixing everything together, be a bit more determinative by taking ES cells, putting them in little wells, and then sprinkling TS cells on top. So that essentially he's hoping that the TS cells will encompass the ES cells. And indeed, that's what happens. And he makes these structures that he calls blastoids that really do look quite similar to the blastocyst itself. They didn't make a lot of primitive endoderm in the first place because they were using ES cells. He's gone on to, to change the situation and get better blastoids with more primitive endoderm. So these are potential models then that you can grow in large numbers to model and study early events in the mouse embryo. Um, but in neither case, in the ETX or the blastoids in the mouse, both groups put them back into the uterus and they show that you can sometimes get an implantation response because that only requires a bit of trophoblast, but they don't make an embryo. They really don't go very far. So these are not really uh, mimicking exactly normal development. But maybe that's just because we don't have the right stem cells. Maybe we need to get stem cells that are more like the cells that lead up to the progenitors of the blastocyst, because the three ES cells, TS and Zen, really in many ways resemble a sort of slight, just after, just after implantation embryo. So it's not surprising that you can't regenerate the processes that lead up to blastocyst formation. So my lab and lots of labs, and increasing, there's still more papers coming out day by day, have been asking, well, could, why is it that we can only capture as stem cells the three restricted lineages of the blastocyst? Why can't we capture the earlier stage, the totipotent stage of development? So if we go back and think about early development, we have a zygote, fertilized egg, totipotent, two cell embryo, individual cells are totipotent, they can make a whole mouse. Uh, and even at the eight cell stage, and we've shown this in many different experiments, that even at the eight cell stage, individual blastomeres are not committed. They can make inner cell mass, they can make trophectoderm. They need other cells to do it, but they're not committed to one lineage or another. Commitment to lineage doesn't occur until late molecular, early blastocyst stage. So could you capture, why can't we capture this state? 
this uncommitted totipotent state. And so there's been a number of different papers, and as I say, there's a whole slew I'm not going to show you today, of recent papers suggesting that it might be possible to either directly from embryos or more likely from starting with ES cells, turn back the clock and push them to a more totipotent state similar to the eight cell or even to the two cell stage. Several years ago, it was shown that in the, in the normal ES cell cultures, there are what are called T, two C-like cells. They express lots of retroposons, so, so always uh, very important structures for early development. But these, these two C-like cells have many of the properties of the two-cell embryo, but it's not clear that they really are totipotent and they certainly don't make stable cell lines. On the other hand, several groups have generated what they call extended potential cells. And particularly these two papers, Yang et al. and Yang et al., one from Hong Kui Deng's lab in uh, uh, Beijing and one from Pentao Lu's lab at the University of Hong Kong, in 2017 claimed to have what they called extended or expanded potential cells that had expressed genes that were perhaps more typical of the eight cell stage and that they claimed were able to, in chimeras, generate not just the epiblast lineages, but also the trophoblast lineages. So we, we and in this case, we is a, a collaboration between my lab, Esther Postvai's lab at Princeton, Frederick Lanner's lab at the Karolinska Institute, uh, and uh, uh, Vincent Pasquet's lab in Belgium, we got together at an ISSCR meeting and started to realize we were all interested in this concept of totipotency. But we realized also that some of the claims of totipotency in the literature were probably a little oversold. So we asked what were the properties you'd want if you wanted to say, I have a totipotent stem cell. And first of all, the expression profile obviously should reflect this pre-blastocyst stage. Cell lines better be stable or they're no use to you. And if they're really totipotent, you should be able to generate easily ES cells and TS cells in vitro. And most importantly in the mouse, you can test out whether they are actually totipotent by asking what happens when you put them back in a blastocyst. Can they make all the cell lineages? So what we did, we did a test case basically. We took the Deng and the Lu extended potential cells before we started to try and make our own and tested them against the criteria. And this was published last year. You can go look at a lot more detail than I'm talking about here. And what we showed there was that the expression profile of these cells does shift from ES cells and shifts a little bit towards pre-implantation development, but certainly not completely. If you just look at this sort of where they plot and uh, principal components, they plot pretty close to ES cells. They are stable. They do generate ES and TS cells, but not terribly efficiently. And do they make trophoblasts? Not very efficiently and not really what we think is, is true trophoblast lineage contribution. And here's just an example to show this was with the pentao Lu cells. And what they claimed in their paper was that they did in see, indeed see, in some kind of cases, contributions of the extended potential cells, not just to the epiblast. So these are GFP-labeled cells. You can see they're beautiful ES cells. They take over the epiblast component. And you do see cells, green cells, out here in what is the, the troph trophoblast, the extra embryonic ectoderm. But if you look carefully, this is TFAP2C, which is a trophoblast gene, and it's expressed. And look at the green cells. Well, they're actually in a gap. Here's L5, another tro trophoblast gene, not expressed in the green cells. You can see this nicely in a single plane with the light sheet microscope. Holes, these are cells. They're they're extended potential cells, they're green, but they're not expressing trophoblast markers. So you've changed the properties of the cells, but you haven't changed their fate. So it does look as though um, pluripotent stem cells and even extended potential cell, stem cells in the mouse seem to have limited capacity to make trophectoderm. As I said, there's been increasing a number of recent papers claiming more totipotency properties in different situations, but it's still not clear that they're truly behaving like a totipotent cell from the embryo. So that's what we know in the mouse. We don't think you can really capture this early totipotent state. And if you want to mimic and model early development, you're probably best off starting with the distinct cell types and putting them together. So why would we want to make 
mouse models at all. We've got embryos. We don't need to make mouse embryo models. But what about humans? This is where the interest has come about in really trying to ask whether it's possible to mimic human embryonic development by taking human stem cells and making stem cell derived embryo models. If you want to understand early blastocyst development, implantation, early uh, uh, primitive streak formation, the beginning of early development in the human, it's hard to get access to human embryo material. There are ethical constraints. There are regulatory constraints. What if you could actually model development using stem cells? So why don't you just take what we did in the mouse and make ES, TS, and Zen and ask whether we can put them together? And so can you do that? Naive ES cells do exist. Human TS cells, it took a while before we tried very hard. It, you can't derive them just with FGF. So different culture conditions, but they have been derived. Zen cells, not quite so clear. We showed that you could get cells that look like Zen by overexpressing a transcription factor. Uh, uh, Josh Brickman's lab recently reported a culture conditions that seems to produce Zen-like cells. Um, but it's not, nobody has actually published taking those three cell types and putting them together to see if they'll make an embryo. What's interesting and what has led to the sort of the latest interest in making human embryo, stem cell derived embryo models, is information that suggests that although I told you mouse ES cells are lineage restricted, they make embryo, they don't make trophoblasts, they don't make extra embryonic endoderm, human ES cells don't seem to be as, as lineage restricted. So lots of bits of evidence, I'm just going to go through them quickly, I'll show you a couple of images. Expression profiles of naive ES cells look a bit more like those extended potential cells in the mouse. They have expression that's typical of the pre-implantation, the blastomere stage of development. Transposons that they express are also similar to cleavage stages. People have made extended potential cells and naive cells. In both cases, it's pretty clear that they do generate trophoblast in culture much better than mouse ES cells do. And there's a series of experiments. If you reprogram and make uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, Jose Polo's lab in Australia has showed that during that process of reprogramming adult cells to pluripotency, you actually along the way generate cells that have trophoblast-like properties. And recently, again, there have been a couple of papers showing that a bit like those 2C-like cells in the mouse, human ES cell cultures seem to contain 8C-like cells, which is actually the time of zygotic genome activation in the, mouse, in the human. So they look like 8-cell blastomers. Bits and pieces of evidence suggesting then that human ES cells may actually be less restricted and may make trophoblast even in the normal situation. And so that has led people to generate human blastoids, not by mixing ES and TS, but actually starting with naive human ES cells and culturing them. And there have been a series, and again, every week there seems to be more papers of this sort, a series of recent papers generating human blastoids, or what people claim are human blastoids, starting just with naive ES cells and growing them in different culture conditions. You see them here in nice little wells. Uh, you see them here uh, in a sort of more of a suspension situation. This is from Austin Smith and Ger Guo. This, this is uh, actually from uh, uh, Jun Wu's lab. Uh, it's another paper that I didn't show here, but uh, from uh, Nicola Rivron's lab. They've all shown that they can generate really quite nice looking blastocysts that really do seem to have trophectoderm on the outside, uh, in a, uh, epiblast and primitive endoderm cells, looking very good and looking like human blastocysts. This is from Jose Polo's lab. In this case, they, they took this idea that during reprogramming, you could get trophectoderm forming, and they tried to stop the reprogramming process and capture the, the blastocyst stage along the way and make these structures here that they think are like blastoids. So are they? You're starting with the S cells. Are you really making a structure that mimics the blastocyst? Is this going to be a good model for human development? Well, I think the, the jury is still somewhat out, but it's, they are, some of them are really quite close looking to a blastocyst. 
but they are heterogeneous. There's no question in all the papers. Nobody claims that they're perfectly uh, um, uh, homogeneous. You always get these blastoids. You have other cell types in these structures. And if you look at the expression data, what you want to know is are those cells, especially the trophectodon, because remember the ES cells, you expect them to be pluripotent. Are you making real trophectodon? And so this is where I, I sort of re, regrouped um, with uh, Frederick Lana, uh, and this time with uh, Jamping Fu's lab in, uh, at Michigan, and we started to look a little bit more carefully at the data sets on the single cell expression data from the different blastoid papers that came out in the last year or so. And so, so in all these cases, what they did was to compare, this is the embryonic data set. So Frederick's lab took all the published data sets from real embryos and made this sort of cluster analysis of how the single cells map to the lineages of the embryo. So we see here is the trophectoderm over here, amnion cells, mesoderm. This is the pre-implantation trajectory. We see a separation of epiblast and primitive endoderm, of, of uh, epiblast and trophectoderm, and then the epiblast separating out into primitive endoderm as well. So this is an embryo data set. So then what they did was overlay the single cell data from the blastoid papers. And what you see as that in these three papers, this is, this is the uh, Guo and Smith paper, um, this, is the, this is the Riveron paper, this is the Jun Wu paper, and you'll see it's not bad. There's obviously in all cases a group of cells, green cells, that plop, they call the epiblast, that map where the epiblast should be. There's a group of cells that they call trophoblasts that map where the trophoblast should be, and a set of cells in the primitive endoderm, looking good. You'll see in all cases, of course, there are other cells, especially a lot of cells that map out here in the amnion. And when you look at the, the, uh, the Jose Polo paper, then you get a whole load of cells that they call trophoblast, which clearly map to the amnion type cells. So they are not trophoblasts, we think they are amnion. Uh, and without going into details, there's a lot of confusion in the literature, but ES cells, human ES cells, can make amnion cells, and amnion cells do have some properties like trophoblast. So you have to be careful. This is the cleanest. It looks beautiful. You see, there don't seem to be many other errant cells, but you also know not many cells here. So this is, this is selected data that Austin Smith and, and Guo did here. So it's early days, but it's very exciting because really the stem cell models can be potential tools to study early development. They're clearly not identical to embryos. Epigenetic state of stem cells is not going to be the same as an embryo. The linear state of all these different ES cells and IPS lines is unclear. You do have to have a gold standard of studying the embryo itself, but they can be useful to study limited events and cell interactions. But are they really going to be useful to study development? And I just want to finish with a couple of thoughts about the ethics underlying this. What happens if we really get good at making embryos from human stem cells? So this, this is the other part of my life. When you work on early development in the mouse, it's fine. You can do all sorts of things. You can make genetically modified mice. You can make stem cells. Translate all that to human and you get into a lot more uh, public, controversial public debate. So it can be a quiet research lab, uh, it becomes controversial. Um, I've been involved all the way down these. We could have a discussion about this every stage along the way. Um, the work that I've done in the mouse has been related to this, and or I've been involved in some of the public debates. Um, what about 1978, the first IVF baby born? How was I involved there? I was working in the lab alongside uh, Bob Edwards when they were doing the IVF. I left in 77 before the first baby was born, but the research was going on on IVF when I was, when I was in Cambridge. Right up to today, so 2018, blastoids, ETS, gastroloids, uh, and of course gene editing along the way. So there are some recent challenging advances, culturing human embryos beyond the 14 day. We've talked about the culture of stem cells, interspecies chimeras, gene editing, gametes from stem cells, but this is the one that we've been talking about today. Are the emergent properties 
going to be morally concerning. If those integrated stem cell models improve and cross a boundary and become closer to real embryos, at what point do we have to start being concerned in a regulatory or even in a sort of moral and ethical uh, debate? And I've been involved in discussions around this. The ISSCR, the International Society for Stem Cell Research, has stem cell guidelines, which has been uh, uh, involved for, for many years, beginning with human ES cells. We had a recent revision that came out last year, and one of the subgroups that I chaired was on looking at em human embryo and stem cell uh, models. And the guidelines that we propose for internationally would be that no stem cell-based embryo model in human, whatever they are, blastoid, gastroloid, whatever, should never be transplanted into a human or an animal uterus. These are in vitro models. They are not reproductive models. Integrated models, by which we mean something like a blastoid that integrates all the cell types you could need to make a functional uh, embryo, should be subject to rigorous review. The scientific rationale has to be clear, and any ethical concerns have to be discussed. And whatever you're doing, whether it's an embryo or a stem cell model, the length of time in culture should be restricted to what's needed for the scientific question under study. Unless, of course, in all cases, it can be restricted by law. So there we are, from the blastocyst to the, uh, the ethics. A lot still to learn about lineage identities in humans, particularly, but even in the mouse, and how they relate to stem cell states. And of course, in the long run, all of this will help us understand normal development, understand reproduction, and make better stem cell models. And it all begins and ends with this beautiful blastocyst. And these are just some of the people involved in some of the more recent work that I talked about. Thanks. Quick advert, you know, everything gets postponed for COVID. Had a great reunion in 2010, was planning one in 2020. 2023, there will be a great meeting in Toronto. Thanks so much, you did not disappoint. Uh, questions from the audience? Maybe all the audience is putting their thoughts together. I had a couple of questions. One of them is going way back to the early work on HIPPO signaling. Um, are YAP and yeah, so, so, so Bob asked, so YAP and, YAP is, YAP and TAS are both co-activators. And uh, to get the phenotype in the early embryo, you actually have to knock out YAP and TAS. So it is involved there as well. Uh, it looks like YAP is the sort of major player there, but yes, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Bob's asking a question about mitochondrial uh, disease uh, and the concept that if you have uh, a, uh, an embryo, a fertilized egg, that has abnormal mitochondria, then you could, there's nothing wrong with the nucleus of those, those cells, but so could you just replace the cytoplasm and give it the right mitochondria. So the way to do that is by nuclear transfer. So you could take the nuclei and put them in a nice uh, egg that has perfectly good mitochondria. That is not allowed in Canada. Uh, it's against, we have something called the Re Reproductive Technologies Act, which bans a lot of things, including gene editing in human embryos and uh, nuclear transfer, which this would fall under. It, is uh, allowed and being explored in the UK, as you know. Um, and I think that it is moving forward, but slowly, because I think there are still some questions uh, about the safety of that approach. No. So human, <laughs> CRISPR gene editing, uh, heritable gene editing in humans is not moving forward anywhere. 
uh, and all the work, all the working groups, all the reports, all say it's not. We don't know it's safe. There's not many good reasons to think about doing it, uh, and let's not. And <laughs> and as I say, in Canada, it's actually against the law. You could be thrown into prison. As we know, there was the case of uh, Dr. He in China who cl claimed and probably did use gene editing uh, to modify the uh, receptor for HIV in two uh, uh, babies. Um, he got into a lot of trouble and did end up in prison. So there you go. Just <laughs> watch it. Hi, um, Alexandra from UBC. I was curious about the ethical implications of some of this, and um, if the hope is to understand more about reproduction, do you see um, the possibility of implanting these embryos in a living uterus as something that might happen, and so those laws might change, and what would be the implication then? Yeah, so, so, so at what point, if we're, particularly with the stem cell models, if you want to understand how it develops in, in further, wouldn't you want to put it back in some sort of uterus? And I think the answer is people will want to do that, but what you can do instead, and what people are working at, is actually try to develop an in vitro model of implantation. So as well as making blastoids, People have made endometrioids, endometrioids, <laughs> is that a word? Uh, uh, and also have been able to make placentoids, so you can actually take later pieces of the placenta. And so that you can now start to think about modeling the implantation process. And I think that's going to be actually very powerful, and it will get over the issue of you know, trying to think about what you would transplant it in. Because putting a human, uh, if you had a human model and you wanted to put it back what would be the host that you would want to put it in, apart from a human? Uh, it wouldn't be a mouse. You know, the, the human blastocyst implants very differently from the, from, from the mouse. The uterine response is extremely difficult. So it's not, there's no easy model to do that. So it has to be an in vitro model. <laughs> 